Yeah. Yeah. It's right above. And the nice thing is that that's articulated, so it can go in and out. So you know, for like for launch and recovery, we'd we'd stow it. Oh, so if you look at satellite feed one, we're pushing that the tray out that the bio box so you can see those two stereo cameras Rachel just, is uh, talking about. Tilted down with the Zeus camera and yeah so you can see the <laughs> the porch underneath which we kind of use as a little guardrail and then the, the stereo pair of the cameras on top of that. <laughs> Thank you for that visual. Okay so it looks like we're at the summit of where we are pretty much it's yeah. pretty flat at looking this point <laughs> yeah looking in the sonar i'm not seeing anything any great inclines ahead of me i'd say this is pretty much no summited. corals too much sand too much sand, sand. all right well, we're really we're really near the end of the dive anyway so if you guys want to prepare roger roger You think it'll take an hour? Uh, from this depth, yeah. Okay. We ascend at two zero meters per second per minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's fast. Big difference, <laughs> yeah. You ready for me to go ahead and turn around? Yeah. I just go. What's that in front of us? What is that in front? What is it? Is it a grenadier? Just a fit? Grenadier fish? Sure, I'm just uh, trying to see if I can get a little close over. Cross it's strung our out at the moment. shark. Yeah. <laughs> Come you on, give us a shark right at that. I'm going to go ahead and go down. Roger. And give you a little bit more delta. I don't think still coming your way as well. Looks Copy pretty that. big. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. What Stand is on. that? Is that a shark? Is that a white tip? Yeah. I think it is a little shark. Oh, look oh at that. Boy. I think that was a shark. Did you highlight it? I'm highlighting it. Come back. Come closer. Stop swimming away. Behave. <laughs> Talking earlier about scaring animals with the ROV, I think <laughs> sharks are one of the very few creatures that do kind of back away. A lot of it, I think, is also because of the electrical impulses, right? Yeah, I was in uh, just off the coast of Cape Breton in Nova Scotia doing a doing a survey there, and we had a great white uh, approach the ROV from the rear, and as soon as he got near the tether, it, it disappeared and hightailed it out of there. Yeah, so sharks on the front of the face have the ampullae of Lorenzini that can sense electrical impulses of their prey. So I think all the electrical equipment given off by Hercules also has a tendency to kind of scare them. That's pretty cool though. What a good way to end the dive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so folks, we are starting our ascent back up to the surface just to give you data of where we're at right now. We're at 1,223 meters. The water temperature is 3.58 degrees Celsius. Our oxygen saturation is 11%, and our salinity is 34.5 PSU. So as we start our ascent, we'll keep the chat open. Feel free to ask us any questions. We are at your mercy. And, um, but we'll have to cut that off when we get to about 50 meters for us to retrieve our just, RVs. Uh, get my log done real quick. Yeah, right to that. I'm just, I'll come up and get myself set up. Yep. That was a magnificent shark sighting. Yeah, I thought it was a grenadier at uh, first, but yeah. then it just looked too dark. Mm. and Very yeah. cold down at 1,200 meters. Yeah. So someone in the shark is saying, or someone in the shark, someone in the chat is saying they think it's a grenadier. But a grenadier? That's mm. what they say. I don't know. We'll have to look at the footage and kind of. Yeah, to have a closer look. I mean, yeah. I usually have the kind of equal pectoral fins and dorsal fin, like a almost like a cruciform from the grenadiers have seen. That didn't look like it to me. The tail looked different as well. But yeah. Uh -huh.
almost done here. There was a sighting of a manta ray today from the top. So Devin was sitting up on the monkey deck and saw a manta ray. So she showed me the picture. It was yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it's a great picture. Wow. So keep your eyes open during this blue water, and you never know what might swim by. Okay, I am all set. Okay, roger that. You are above me, so I'm going to go ahead and start coming up. And turning off auto heading. Roger. Auto heading's off. Copy that. That looks good. Start to string out. Ship's heading just changed though? Yeah, they've been rotating. They're still kind of going. Okay, look at that. Just trying to uh, mm -hmm. lateral myself across. Mm -hmm. Forwards and up. It's going to go like that. Ah. Dan, would you like to give us a recap of our dive from today? Sure. So we started out at 11, well, no, I'm sorry, 10 a, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. is when we started out. Um, descended down for about an hour. Then when it hit about, um, so got to the bottom around 10 and then started an orbit survey. And that lasted almost till 11 o'clock. So we used the Norbits to give us high resolution sonar of the way down, so it gives us centimeter level scales. And as we continue down to this canyon, um, got to see you know a lot of nice, a lot of nice uh, ge geography uh, features. Uh, saw some basalt columns, saw some lava flows. Uh, I think they were talking. To, uh, Dr. Mayor was talking about sedentary rocks, and um, uh, and showing how. The basalt columns form, the lava flow, and then they also had um, the dust that settled. So they described a number of geological features. Um, I think uh, at that point they set up for photogrammetry, and uh, Jonathan exercised the cameras very, you know, in this constrained submarine can uh, canyon. At that point, we sort of rolled down um, the canyon a little bit as it got steeper and steeper explored, see if there was any more cool terrain, and then we spent the last hour or so exploring up the canyon walls, ascending about a thousand feet up the sheer cliff to the very top, and then once we got to almost the top of uh, the cliff, uh, it's time to come back up. So now we are in blue water ascending, and that'll take us about another hour to get to the surface. Thank you for that update, or er, dive Summary. <laughs> there we go. Those are 
right, so a lot of the chats, uh, lots of different ideas on what potentially that last now. fish was that we saw. Was it a shark? Was it a grenadier? Um, was it something completely different? So we will have to get back to you on that one. Purely based on its reaction for me, that would say more shark than grenadier. Yeah, because it's mm. re grenadiers don't swim away like that. No, I've it, it, yeah, done bottom surveys before and been accompanied by two or three grenadiers that just swim yeah. alongside you, not bothered at all. The way that yeah. disappeared into the distance, that would kind of lead me to believe it was more shark. They did have a number of six-gilled sharks that they would see here yeah. in this area, so they're known to inhabit this area. I don't know what kind of shark I don't it think was. it looked like a six-gill, though. Um, doo -doo -doo. We have a question about what time is the dive tomorrow, and I don't think we know. <laughs> yes, I was like, uh, all those details have not been provided, Chad. Hey, yeah, so... They have a, a meeting at 7, but we're in the control room, so we don't know yet. <laughs> so stay tuned to our um, social media and our status on our website, and we will update that slower, with information for you. Uh, lots of marine snow. Yes. In this photo. What is marine snow, Dan? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one that brought it up. <laughs> so it is essentially the it's essentially the um, decaying matter of fins and or you know scales and all kind of living things that yeah. left off of fish dead, and then dead, dead plants yep. animal material even throw in a couple of feces into that there you go <laughs> i didn't want to bring that up but you can you can add that that essentially just you know decay and start floating and then slowly 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 settle to the bottom of the ocean and yeah. then that becomes food mm -hmm. for the deep sea creatures so it's given that name marine snow because it obviously looks like it's kind of snowing, but it's a lot more kind of disgusting than that. But it's really important part of the carbon pump to provide that nutrients to the deep and then also just remove carbon out from the, not out of the cycle because it's all part of it, but yep. to um, store the carbon. Store it, yeah. Out of the atmosphere. Out of the atmosphere, yes. So carbon as part of the carbon cycle can go through many forms in the atmosphere. It's a gas, it's carbon dioxide. You also have carbon incorporated into your biomolecules, your tissues, think your sugar is mostly carbon. We are carbon-based life forms, so you have carbon stored all up in your body. Every time you poop, you are also releasing carbon because the food you eat has carbon. So we are all part of the carbon cycle. And carbon dioxide can also dissolve into our water. And so you get carbonate ions, which are used for our shellfish and our crustaceans and corals to be able to build that calcium carbonate skeletons. And then um, CO2, though, can also react with water and you get carbon carbonic acid, which causes ocean acidification. So too much carbon is a bad thing, but you still need carbon as well. So oh it's yeah. a fine balance between the two. Slow down a bit more. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> That's a very good explanation. Well, I say this expedition is going very well. We're seeing a lot of cool things. And the technology is moving along. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm very impressed with the uh, just the fusion of the technology. You know, now we're getting to a pattern where we're starting out with the Norbit sonar scan. I mean, this is how it sort of works. We start with the, you know, the multi-beam sonar that gives us, you know, 50 meter resolution. And that kind of where we start to dive plan. Um, I'm, you know, I'm looking at the, 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 you know, the essentially the bathymetry right now um, as we go. 
and that's where we start. And then we do the Norvit scan that gives us centimeter resolution. Um, and we do that and that allows us to really pick out nice op outcroppings and geological features that we essentially go and look at and get cool shots or see lots of uh, biodiversity, corals, animals, that type of stuff on it. Um, and then, you know, the, the photogrammetry allows us to take really high resolutions with the new cameras and then build 3D models. And those 3D models will be put up on Sketchfab. So I think it's going along very well. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the fusion of the high resolution sonar with the high resolution camera. So you can get that sonar type image, but you get the texture and the visuals of what does the color in the coral look like. When's that going to be done, Jonathan? We are working on that as we speak down in the data lab. How did I know that? It's incredible. That's amazing. So how is Blue Water going? It's wonderful. Well, did you catch the, we think we might have had a little shark at the top. A baby shark, do, 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 do. <laughs> um, someone was saying dogfish shark in the chat, and I was just looking up, and Zach, look at the comb-toothed dogfish. And oh, see it, what does you think. it does have white. It does have a little bit of white on that. That would be. I like comb yeah. tooth. Yeah, there's a lot of sharks with, like, little white tips. Yeah, uh, so. But, but yeah, I mean that was definitely a smaller shark with pretty like small pec fins. Yeah. Uh, they weren't super large, right? That's like a characteristic of sharks. They have those fixed pec fins. Um, but yeah, a lot of these deeper ones have very small and <laughs> I wouldn't say less stiff. They're just not as as um, as large. So yeah, that that could be it. Hey, seventy. I'm just, I just feel lucky we got a chance to see it. I think that was the only shark that we we saw the whole day. Yeah, I think so. Well, that we believe is a shark. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for pointing it out. It was a pretty quick I'm sighting. Hoping. I think I'm crossing my fingers I, and hoping, you know. I think, it, I think it was a shark of some sort. I'm liking the look of this comb tooth dogfish shark here. Yeah, but. there was another one. Um, I think someone sent it in the chat also. What was, um, I don't know the common name of it, but another one similar to, to the dog tooth, yeah. Yeah. Or dog, dog fish. Yeah, I was trying to look up a common name for this one that was sent. Yeah. Um, the... Penta, penta, did. Pentank today, Pentank today. Yeah. Cat shark. White ghost cat shark. Yeah, I, I mean it looks pretty similar to the to the uh, dogfish from a distance, so. Well, I can go through the animal. Uh, animal oh, yeah. What's the, what I've counts do you to have keep for counts us? Because we've had more variety. We started out with just shrimp. Yeah, not too many shrimps on this. So yeah, right now I have six shrimp, but I don't know what to classify the gray one with the white antlers. It was a shrimp. It was but shrimp. It was a shrimp. Then yeah. you get seven. So but you seven. got, you know. That was a really big, big shrimp, though. Yeah, it was we different. Thought it was, we thought it was a lobster at first. It's oh, I missed it. I was at yeah, dinner. Yeah, Taylor Ann was up here for that one. And then we had. Did you get an ID on it? Um, I don't know if we actually got a f finalized ID on it. And then we got a three headless chickens. Yeah. A lot of headless chickens today. A lot you know, of we just get one. Chickens. And then I have two sea cucumbers. Well, headless chickens are also sea cucumbers, so okay. really that's five. Then I'm just saying I had two regular ones. <laughs> Two boring sea cucumbers. So I have five total now, if you add those two together, and one goosefish. Our, we can't have a shift without a goosefish. What would we be without that? So the shrimp was gray body with uh, 
uh, three pair of white uh, um, antenna. So, Zach, someone else is commenting in the shark that they agree that shark ID is complicated without a decent image, but they do say that they think it's not a cat shark because cat sharks have their dorsal fins far back on their bodies that are behind the anal fin. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get that good a look. I, yeah, if if they notice that, that, then yeah, I won't argue that. Oh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't see for think, sure where the dorsal fin was positioned. I think our viewers at home have the advantage that they can pull it up on YouTube, pause, rewind, that we are not doing that because we have to use our internet bandwidth for streaming this to you. Oh, and then someone else is saying that catfish are apparently only found in the Atlantic. So. Well, that'll do it too. <laughs> I'll take some of the, more of that candy stash. What is everyone's favorite type of candy? Oh, I'm a Reese's Peanut Butter Cups guy. I have not had any this Halloween. I'm kind of missing it. I come from Pennsylvania. We're near Hershey, so i got to be a Hershey's guy. <laughs> Zach, what's your favorite type of candy? Anything chocolate. <laughs> As a grad student, my favorite probably has been uh, chocolate-covered espresso beans. <laughs> I've been living on those have more than I should. Have you had the chocolate-covered pea berry beans? No. Do you know what a pea what berry is? is? You're a big I mean, I've heard of a pea berry, yeah, but I don't think I've ever had. So for our viewers, pea berry, so coffee is actually a cherry. Uh, if you see coffee growing on a plant, it's a cherry tree, and it's a red fruit. And so the coffee bean are the two seeds inside that cherry, and then they dry the beans and uh so you dry them out remove the husk and it's a whole process but and you roast them right so there's caffeine and most cherries have two seeds so a pea berry is a genetic mutation where all the caffeine goes into one so you have like one really big bean and one very tiny little baby bean that has nothing in it so everything all the caffeine goes into that one bean so they are really highly caffeinated but it's supposed to be easier on your stomach not quite as acidic so it's a smoother coffee with more coffee like more coffee so you get more bang for your buck with pea berry but the amount of pea berries is very very small amount that of these coffee beans make pea berry and so if you go to the and i don't even drink coffee <laughs> which is a funny thing is I know this, but I always, whenever I go to Big Island, people, my friends want to go to um, the coffee farms because Kona coffee is world famous. And so Kona pea berry is like some of the most expensive coffee you can get, but they do chocolate covered pea berries. And what they told me when I went to the this tour is you are limited you can only eat six of these because otherwise you'll get like heart palpitations and it could leave you to have like t it's too much caffeine it can like really so don't take that as a challenge that but sounds like the so right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just got everyone here being like well, we're gonna try this out but yeah that's what they told me is it's not medically recommended for you to take eat more than seven of these chocolate covered Pea berries. Huh. Welcome this 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. I was going to say, prove it. <laughs> so I bought some and sent them to my parents over Christmas, and I totally forgot to give them this medical disclaimer, but they didn't have any heart attacks as far as I know. I mean, if you're not having heart palpitations, <laughs> then you're not doing coffee, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Are 
We should have put that on the list. Yeah, I can give you a whole list of Hawaii musties and restaurants and all that. Cool. I definitely need to find those visa. Yeah. Please. I can tell you where to get them. <laughs> You're just staying on Oahu, yeah? Oh, is that yeah. a big jelly or what is that? I think that was there. actually marine snow. Is that oh, wow. like is mucus? That a yeah. Larvation hose? Oh, where are the pea berries? No, the what we just saw oh. on the screen. <laughs> the larvation hose. Did it? I just had my first warhead in like 20 years, probably, and I think I just had some heart palpitations from that. <laughs> That was they not a good idea. Warheads has dialed it down from when they first came out. I mean, that that's stuff used to peel the skin right yeah, out of your mouth. Yeah, that's very true. I eat lemons, and as a kid, I ate lemons, and warheads would make me go, but these ones are, like, not sour at all to me. <laughs> I'm not a sour guy. I don't know why I did that. No, oh, because it's the last candy in the bowl left. Yeah. That's why you did it. <laughs> I wanted a lemon drop. Now I'm at the lemon drop. So, Mike, what's your favorite candy? Ooh, are we talking like traditional Halloween candy? No, just any candy, I guess. Any candy? Yeah, Zach said chocolate-covered coffee beans, so. Mm. It's a difficult one. Uh, I'm, I'm a lemon heads. Lemon yeah. heads, mm. oh. Lemon heads. That's not a very common choice. I like it. Simon, how about you? Uh, Do you have any weird Canadian or English candy you prefer? Growing up as a kid, I used to be a little sweet shop next to the bus stop. They used to go to catch the bus to school, and they used to have all the all the sweets in jars on the shelves, and used to get a quarter pound in a little paper bag of sweets. And my favorite there was pineapple cubes. Pineapple cubes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in Hawaii, we actually have um, candy stores that they make their own candy, and they're called crack seed stores. So candy, Hawaiian candy is actually called crack seed. Um, so it's kind of funny. People have gotten in trouble at the airport being like, what is this? And they're like, oh, it's only crack seed. <laughs> 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 but a lot of it is like, you know, the lihi moi is kind of this plum powder. There's all sorts of it. Zach, have you ever tried it? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the the actual like plum itself <laughs> i like the the limoy powder on top of candy and yeah. like the the lemon peel gummy bears and stuff those, oh those are good i'll eat those like yeah. every day but limoy on pineapple oh yeah, yeah. limoy on pineapples or if you get like a margarita yeah. with a limoy rim too those yeah. are, that's pretty good the other big one out here is a pickled mango pickled mango is popular yeah, yeah. I just like the saying more than the food. I just I just love saying bingo, bango, pickle, mango. <laughs> I enjoy that more than the food itself. <laughs> Johan, what's your favorite candy? Uh, I think I'm a classic Reese's kind of guy. Um, but I actually Reese's. prefer, like, Trader Joe's makes a dark chocolate Oh, Reese's my God, cup. I love Oh, the peanut butter those, cup? The dark yeah. chocolate Trader Joe's. I miss those and the espresso beans every time. Oh, I miss Trader Joe's dark yeah. chocolate peanut so Johan, I have a question for you on the uh, Norvis display. Is it is it really coming up, or like was that was that our wall that we ascended? On which display, sorry? Uh, you see it on the uh, front screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Or, um, or, yeah. is, or is that just our ascent? I think where the, the cyan and the green is, I think that's where we left the bottom, and okay. the rest of it is our ascent. So Correct. Yeah. Kind of looks pretty cool there. It but does. Mm -hmm. yeah, it does like they shouldn't show a bottom, though. Hmm. That's because we rise and it's showing a... Yeah, I don't know whether it's reflecting off. It's interesting. Yeah. I know Chris has a few different settings on the way. He has, like, a water column setting. I'm not sure if he's okay. put it on or not. Um, or you can kind of just see what's beneath you as you move through the water column. I w this is just the first time I saw that, so I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, okay. me as well, honestly. So, some a viewer is saying that their favorite candy is airhead candies, and that's what I'm currently eating. And then another viewer is still talking about the shark, 
and they said that whoever said that the cat sharks are only found in the Atlantic, okay. is it true that there are different species? And there's an example of a cat shark from Hawaii. So I guess cat shark is still in the running. Yeah. Take this bowl away from me. I will eat it all. Dave, I'm passing this back up. <laughs> Put it over there for me. Thank you. And Dave, you haven't shared what your favorite candy is. I was hoping you'd forget about me. Oh, never forget about you. <laughs> chocolate, anything chocolate. Um, Are you a chocolate espresso no, bean I don't, person? I, I, no, not at all. You're I don't. not going to take the pea berry <laughs> challenge when we get off the ship? No, thank you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't use coffee in any form. So Diet Coke is my preferred caffeine delivery system. Um, I bought some uh, chocolate-covered pineapple, mm. dry, dried Ooh, pineapple chocolate-covered. Yeah. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and they're all gone now. Uh, sorry, I didn't share. Um, uh, I like the Li Hing uh, coated stuff like the uh, lychee gummies, the uh, yeah. pineapple rings. Yeah. Those are good. I have bought a couple of uh, packages of those to take home. Uh, also not sharing those. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, dark chocolate coated peanut M&Ms. Yes. Oh, those are very good. I only Could try like that. I only like dark chocolate. Yeah, I'll like eat I'll eat milk chocolate. Yeah. but it's not my preferred. I do like Reese's yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. but I would heartbeat take dark chocolate peanut butter cups any day. I have peanut M and M's, uh, leftover Halloween candy, so they'll those will be showing up tomorrow. Uh, I asked Pete to bring candy up, and he brought his candy that he's trying to get rid of. And that's what we got tonight. And he wouldn't bring up my bowl of, uh, of peanuts, uh, peanut M&Ms. So tomorrow we'll have peanut M&Ms if nobody has peanut allergies. I don't know. Anyone have a peanut allergy in here? Nope. And uh, one of my favorites is uh, Snickers bars. Oh, I love Snickers. I have a couple I of those agree. left. I used to love the Snickers Blizzard at Dairy Queen. Uh, and they got rid of that one. Yeah. A long time ago. Yeah, I haven't had Dairy Queen since, I think. <laughs> serves them right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on forever strike. There you go. I think they make ice cream now that you can buy at the Snickers. Yeah, but those aren't as good. They're not as good? I don't like those for some reason. I don't know. No? It's not the same as the Blizzard. Does McDonald's do a Snickers? No. Theirs is always broken anyways. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think they used to do M&M's and Oreo. So the chat is asking if anyone's tried dark chocolate coated orange or pineapple sticks. So Dave just shared he likes that dark chocolate pineapple. Um, I have had it, but it's been a long time since I've had some dark chocolate fruit covered. Actually, dark chocolate mango. That's where it's at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, apparently, correction, it was the white ghost cat shark is the one that's only found in Atlantic, not cat sharks only in Atlantic. Starting to leave you behind. All right, our current depth is 518 meters. Our water temperature is 6.37 degrees Celsius. Oxygen saturation is up to 11.2%, and our salinity is 34.2 PSU. So you can actually find all of this live data that I'm reading off on our website if you go to nautiluslive.com on our home screen. And then you click over on the right hand side, you'll see a little bar that says technology and it says acoustic system, telepresence, it gives you the ship's heading, wind speed, and then there's a little link that says more data. And if you click that more data, it'll give you the real time data that I'm reading off. So if you 
are a data buff and like to track this kind of things. It's actually pretty cool. It'll show you the whole, it'll, it'll show you the heave, the pitch, and the roll of the ship. It'll show you the ship setting, heading. Um, it'll also give you a profile of Hercules depth. It says Argus depth, but again, we're diving at Atalanta, not Argus. Um, but so don't get confused by that, but it shows the depth of the dive um, and you can track it back. It also shows us the change in oxygen. So I think this is pretty cool. You can see what our lowest oxygen was, which looking at this, it looks like it was around 7.14. And so we're already up to 12.96 and you can see that change in oxygen. It also has the temperature and salinity and shows all the data collected over the entire dive. So it's pretty cool parameters to kind of see and look at as you, if you want. I have a student asking a question. I told my students if they signed in, or not signed in, but if they watched the videos and would ask questions, I'd give them some extra credit on their quiz. So Very I, nice. Yeah, so um, I have a student asking, what are some major problems we face during this exploration or this expedition? So Dan, do you wanna, problems we faced? Problems. I think it's data overload. Yeah. So, um, men, like, these cameras, you know, well, one, the cameras overheat, you know, the cameras produce a lot of heat, especially when you're pulling data off of them. So we've had thermal management issues where we've had to cool the cameras with ice bags just to keep them cool enough to operate. Um, and then we've had to pull terabytes and terabytes of data <laughs> off these cameras overnight. Um, and I know we're running a fiber optic, you know, data line up, you know, so you think it would be lightning speed, but, you know, having how many images do we get, Zach? Uh, you know, 1,000 images, 2,000 images, 10,000 images at 6K, you know, you're talking, what, 30, 40 megabytes a piece? You know, so that all adds up. So just, you know, what do we do with all that data? And then the other thing is we've run out of processing power. So as, as you heard, you know, we have really, you know, we have a whole rack of computers that are just continuing to go at nonstop. And we just can't keep up with processing it. So people are like, well, where's the models? And we're like, well, it sometimes takes 15, 20 hours to pull this together, right, Zach? So I just, you know, these are the things that we're always facing here of just, you know, it's not just getting the cameras to work, it's all the little stuff behind it that has to happen. And then, as Rachel was just talking about, we're, we're maxing out all our pipelines, getting the data back to you. We got this video streaming going on. We have data coming out for preparing for the next dives. We have models being uploaded. So we're using every bit of satellite, you know, internet speed we can use. And then um, another question they have is, does climate change affect marine life in the deep more than marine life near the surface? And I don't think that's a hard question to say. There's a lot more research and studies done on marine ecosystems at the surface than the deep. And I think the deep, it takes a lot more time and effort to get into it. So I think the changes and the effects might not be seen in the deep as soon as changes in the surface. But to quantify that is something that we can't really say yet or not. But Zach, you do a lot of coral surveys in our surface. Can you talk about climate change effects you've seen there? Yeah, I mean, the like you're saying, yeah, the surface gets affected, um, I think, a little more than the deep. It just goes through a lot more variability um, throughout the seasons or um, just sporadically. I mean, especially here in Hawaii, you have, you have many things affecting it. You have runoff, you have um, nutrition from, or nutrition, nutrients from um, uh, just things on the land from terrestrial that flow in. Um, you have a lot of factors affecting it. So 
Um, I'm one that's on the side of corals are stronger than we, you know, we give them credit for, and they they've survived a lot of things, and um, I think they'll keep finding ways to survive. They they obviously go through their spurts of of die-offs or of being sick and bleaching and whatnot, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it is being affected for sure in certain ways, and that's why we're we're monitoring, and it'll be interesting to see how it adapts um, in the coming years because it's you know kind of out of our hands. We can't really control. The way the the you know the reefs and everything uh, react, all we can do is control what we're putting in. So, um, yeah, Hawaii has all different forms of legislation and management going through the processes right now, and uh, yeah, hopefully we just do the best we can to take care of them. Thank you, Zach. And then the last question they have is, did the ocean current affect your data collecting? I don't think there was too much current at this dive site. Simon, how much current did you guys have? Oh, you're not on SPL. Yeah, the current was minimal um, where we were diving. It was, uh, yeah, we kind of assessed that we can release all our controls on the ROV and see which way we drift, and it was you know, fairly benign down there. Not, not a lot of current at all, to be honest. And I think um, it depends on your data. So I think the current more so affects the difficulty for driving the ROVs um, more so than like collecting data such as temperature and salinity. But if it's harder to drive the ROVs because of current, that could affect the video modeling and photogametry, I would think. Yeah, certainly. And when we go doing the the laterals across the cliff face, you know, if it, there was a significant current in one direction, we'd, you'd notice a, a significant difference in the speed we could we could attain going one direction and the other, and how hard it would be to maintain a, a set distance from the from the cliff face. But it was it seemed pretty benign down there today, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just depends on what type of current. You know, if it's yeah. warm water over cold, or you know, cold water over warm. You know, that that will affect the USBL. Yeah. So how accurate the nav is down there. So, but the current speed usually doesn't affect it, it's the temperature differences and the different layers. Yeah, I'm seeing some changes in current as I come up through the water column. I'm having to put some lateral input into the ROV to maintain a, a position at the stern. So, and I'm seeing that swing from one direction to the other as we come up. So there is some variation in the direction of currents through the, the vertical water column. So there, so you're feeling some layers there? Definitely some layers yeah. here, yeah. Yeah. And that will affect your USB navigational accuracy. That's the correct, yeah. And then, Zach, apparently your protest of you, specifically, not eating at Dairy Queen has been heard because they have brought the All Snickers right. Blizzard back. Oh. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Now, I don't know if there's a Dairy Queen on Big Island, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, we arrive on Oahu. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to go back. Yeah, that was like my, my childhood favorite. So I guess you have to relive your childhood. Yeah, I wonder if it'll hold know. up to your memory or not. I hope so. <laughs> it's always a letdown when things are better in your mind than they actually are. <laughs> I don't know. How can Snickers be bad? It's, it's very true. Snickers and, Snickers and, Snickers and, ice, and cream. Vanilla ice cream? I don't see how it can be yeah. bad. It's very true. We may have to go find a DQ. I'm with yeah. you. DQ and I think it's DQ around when we arrive. Can we get deliveries to the wow. port? Wow, I don't Some know. DoorDash or something? I don't get to use that on Big Island either. All right, so. I'm here for you all. <laughs> I have to add that to my uh, to my fast food go-to. Uh, yeah. John <laughs> generally, it's a toss-up between McDonald's or Taco Bell. <laughs> yep. Those are the that. two closest to my school, so those tend to be my go-to as well. It's dangerous. Yeah. So yeah, John it is. Yes. They were wondering what type of hardships did you, fa technical challenges did you face with this camera system? It's actually like, one of my high school students yes. asked that question. What kind of hardships? Yeah. With that the you camera have to system. overcome. Just tech, uh, they asked just on the expedition, not specific, but I feel like the only kind of technical hardships have been more your camera system and lear learning the workflow and uploading and whatever. I said heat. These cameras, yeah, yeah these heat. cameras are hot cameras. Because they're big cinema cameras um, that are recording it at amazing resolutions um, that we put inside a giant titanium bottle. And I will let your science teacher calculate or ask you to calculate <laughs> the yeah, thermal you conductivity you want of, one inch, of one inch of titanium <laughs> in water 
But needless to say, although the water is very cold, titanium is very excellent at retaining heat or not allowing heat to transfer very rapidly is the better way to put that. So anyway, we have hot cameras, and then you have four, three cinema grade cameras that are being controlled through an ethernet um, port. So the cameras were designed that way, but that still doesn't mean that's how they're usually used. Most people are standing next to their camera and pressing record and looking at the settings and pressing physical buttons while we're doing everything entirely remotely through an ethernet connection. So although it was designed that way, let's just say that there's a lot of bugs in how the camera is controlled through ethernet. Um, and so the process of figuring out what the heck is wrong. Oh, and then you have all of the regular problems of just like lenses and sharpness. Why does this look a little defocused? Blah, 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 blah. Um, like the normal stuff. So the problems that we've been running into, the hardships are mostly on the ethernet side because we are sticking things in a bottle and we're putting it and we're trying to communicate with it through eight kilometers of fiber optic line. Um, we have small pipes in terms of the internet. Like we only, we're, we don't have a great deal of bandwidth going into the cameras themselves. Um, and all of the work has to be done remotely. In fact, what I was just talking back there with uh, uh, Rachel Simon, um, who's, this, who's, who's our, our partner on this project, data engineer, absolutely brilliant mind in terms of troubleshooting and being able to program as we were doing a, a, a pros and cons analysis of, of a serious decision to open up one of the bottles um, to fix a problem. And whether or not we could correct this problem through an ethernet-based uh, uh, solution or for further sniffing of uh, of what's going on with the camera to see if we can reboot some of the elements on the inside to fix it, um, or whether or not we needed to open the bottle to physically change it. And opening a bottle in a deep water camera system is relatively safe, but definitely not without its risks always. Um, so and you'll what see are those risks? The risks are mostly that we spend a lot of time making sure the inside of the cameras are dry, or the inside of the bottles are dry. So there's the risk of flooding first. Yep. A lot of pressure. Um, and if you have even a single little speck of dust that allows oh, any intrusion past the seal, then that will be a catastrophic flooding event um, uh, down once you're down at the bottom or the pressure changes when you're coming back up. So you can, you can avoid that by being very sterile and clean. Like, and, and ROV engineers like Dan, um, who's again our, our awesome partner on this project, wouldn't have been able to do anything without him. You know, he's opened and closed thousands of bottles. He I'm has sure. quite a fan following in the chat, it seems. Oh, yeah. Well, not recent because he's not on here, but every time they're like, Dan the man. Oh, yeah, Dan the man. Um, he's, he's a great engineer, and uh, he fixes problems and, and thinks about problems and, and and I like working with them on that front. But anyway, so we do this compare contrast analysis. Dan doesn't want to open the bottle because bottles have risks. Um, uh, Rachel uh, and I are looking at uh, the available data to tell us exactly what's going wrong with the lens. And me, I'm much more of the kind of like, well, we should just clean the contacts on the lens and tighten things up because I think the lens is coming loose. So it's a good back and forth of how you solve a problem like that. No one's standing up and saying, no, absolutely not. We're going to do it like this. It's everyone actually coming together, discussing all of the options, weighing the pros and cons, and then moving forward with the best solution for tomorrow's dive. And that ultimately is what um, sets the expectation for what you'll do, how you'll troubleshoot the problem, and then uh, how you'll move forward for it. Um, and a viewer asked if this is the last dive. This is not the last dive. We will also be diving on Friday and Saturday. And then another question is asking, why did it stop taking pictures after 9,999? Oh, fantastic. That's because the programmers of the camera, because it's a cinema camera, probably didn't think that someone was going to go out there and take 10,000 photos with it in a single dive before formatting their camera. So. Like, great example of an unanticipated problem um, that you could not predict until we reached 9,999 photos. 
But interestingly, that's again, that's part of engineering. Um, that's part of how you develop a camera system or a new technology is we reached 9,999 during a cruise that was specifically to develop and troubleshoot and create the processes that help this camera work. Um, we now know that metric. That metric was completely unknown to the internet, even in the open APIs and through the process of actually making this data open source, and especially the, ca the command and control software for that's been developed. Um, it's very valuable. I mean, just today, actually, from a collaborator up at, at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, we got another email that's saying, hey, I'm looking for a box camera that can take fantastic photos and can be controlled through the internet. Uh, this. This is not the only solution out on the market, but when it comes to controlling a high-resolution camera with a robot, mm -hmm. this is the only solution really on the market. Um, because uh, Sony, Panasonic, they have great cameras, but they are have, have what's called uh, the API, how a program communicates with a camera is very locked down and you can't use them effectively on a robot. So, um, Anyway, didn't it stopped taking pictures of 999 because we're using the camera on an edge case. But this edge case is is actually universal for people in our community of strapping on cameras that need to view things in very low light and want to take nice pictures. So it benefits everyone that we, in fact, had a dive where we had a big problem, a failure in the dive, um, and we solved that for, for the greater engineering community that might want to look at these use these cameras. I like the, you're doing the greater good for everyone. <laughs> we all fail at some point for the greater good of all. <laughs> I mean, you just can't, no one definitely. Uh, it's not a failure too. I mean, it, it was a bummer to lose that at the time that we did on the dive, but we had a backup plan. We executed the backup plan. We still got good data off of the dive and we learned. I we're getting into our squid layer a little early. We're only at 117 meters, but I'm starting to see squid around. Those are fish. You have fish? Yeah. Definitely fish movements. Oh, you're right there. Yep, fish. I wonder if we'll be inked again. Didn't you say you made a little video of Hercules gets inked? Oh, yeah. I think, uh, I, think I called it Squid Squad. And squid Squad. On YouTube. <laughs> Look it up. It's cute. Do you know what you call a fish with no eyes? Fish. Yes. <laughs> 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 it's been a long day. <laughs> well, something. Really like the thing. <laughs> Let's see if no the idea. chat. <laughs> Let's see if the chat has any corny marine call? dad jokes for us. What is? What do you call a deer with no eyes and no legs? A deer with no Still eyes. No and idea. <laughs> oh, there we got it. There it is. Oh, there it no is. white deer. There's no white deer. Oh, I see the squid. Yeah, it's our tradition. So in that third frame on your bottom, the third small one from the left, yeah. Huh? There, there was something that when the ink came, it was just like hanging on next in that third frame, the oh, black yeah. and white one. There was a huge cloud over there for a minute, and then. I think it that all this coagulated less is in ink front. and more of a giant, like, excrement layer. <laughs> yeah. It's very yellow. It was a big cloud, like, very large. All right, so I have another question in the chat. Does the Nautilus try to stay directly above the ROVs, or should I say, do the ROVs normally try to stay below the Nautilus? Like, how far horizontally away from Nautilus do the ROVs go? You're not on SPL, Simon. So that depends sometimes on the way the vessel's moving, the subsea current. Um, etc., and how that affects the cable going down to Atalanta. So, generally, Hercules' position is dictated by the position of Atalanta, and that's dictated by movement of the water, be that from the ship, ship at the surface or the uh, the currents themselves. So they do. It does have some range of motion, right? It does not have to stay directly below the ship. Right. It can 
we can we do have the ability to to lateral Atlanta to a certain extent. Um, however, it is limited because it's just it's a as mentioned a two thousand pound weight dangling on the end of a wire. So yeah, it's, it doesn't have any vertical uplift to to aid it in that. So I got no very forward thrusters. No, no forwards. So we could kind of lateral and spin on its axis, but uh, extremely limited movement. So. I have. If you look on SAT-3, you can see high pack, which is the navigation, one of the navigation screens. Uh, you can see the track of the ship, Atalanta and Herc. Oh, very cool. Johan could tell you more about what's going on there. All He's busy. All stop at five zero meters. Yes. All right. Bridge, bridge, all stop at five zero. All right, we have to sign off. Thank you so much for your questions and join in tomorrow night. Have a good night. Good night. Camera is up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to secure thrusters. Okay, thrusters are secured. Securing Paro and SVS. Use SBLs off, off, sonars off, light bank is going off, lights are off.
Control uh, deck, can Herc uh, go ahead a little bit? Stop and Herc, that's good. Copy. All stations, that's uh, her connected to the crane, starting to recover. Copy, starting recovery.
Uh, control, deck, uh, that's us uh, stopped even in to give you a chance to uh, go a bit over to the port. Copy that, coming port. Copy that. Okay, control starting to recover again. Copy. All stations, that's her coming out of the water. Back deck, power is secure. Copy that, power is secure.